right, what is up, folks? It is John and Tucker with Heavy Metal Dungeon Masters. My title that I came up with late one night because I couldn't come up with anything else. Uh, <laughs> so I so I kind of talk about what, what we're doing here today. Um, Tucker is in a band called Throne of Iron that I scoped out a few years back. Pretty dope. And they're a lot of fun. He's got some. Uh, he's got a story about Gen Con that we won't talk about. But uh, you can if uh, you want. But it's probably not the time or place. Probably not the time or the place. But uh, you know, he he was throwing he was throwing on some some of the heavy metal riffs, the fantasy riffs, uh, and has been super into kind of like kind of the old school style, like D and D stuff. Uh, definitely with the aesthetic and the like and uh, we were kind of chatting and it turns out he wants to bring some new players into playing Dungeons and Dragons totally cool, something I have done many times, but he has some questions, he was a little concerned about how do you bring in new people what do, yep. you, what do you do, like how do you make sure you don't scare them off if you will, because uh, it can happen, it can happen uh, and thank you for the hosting, someone's hosting me and I really can't I forgot to put my, redo my overlay and there it is. Okay, cool. So, but thank you very much. Um, oh, Desif, yeah, thank you, man. That's uh, Scott. Uh, so, yeah, dude. So we were kind of talking about like that, and I figure you wanted to hit me up, and uh, and I was kind of like, well, why don't we just do it on a show, man? I got mm -hmm. a Twitch stream. You like you you like to do the Twitch. You like to get on the internet and and do videos yeah. about the wildness of of the world. So why not just do this this way, man? So, yes. uh, why don't we, I, I figure why don't we, like, Tucker, why don't we talk a little bit about, like, expectations, what you're trying to do here, what you're trying to, like, what your goals are today, and why don't, why don't we pick, like, one goal, one idea here, concern about bringing in new players, and really delve into that today. Oh, okay. I think the best place to start with that is, I know, I know quite, a, I just moved back to my hometown for some time. Okay. I moved back to my hometown. My hometown is in, in rural southern Indiana, pretty small like 2,000 people-ish. I always wanted to play D&D &D growing up. There were no people that played D&D &D here growing up. So what I'm, I'm starting from scratch with a lot of people. I really am. So that's my game plan, because I have a lot of people that I went to school with and people that I just know from moving back here that always wanted to play. They never had a chance because they're in the same situation that I was. And I just want a good, like, ground level, like you said, don't scare them off. Uh, <laughs> back like just a, a solid foundation for them to get into role playing. Okay, so I think that the so these are people that have never played, uh, and that that's okay. So yeah. the thing is to is to let them understand a few things. One is they they're they they should go in with you and them should go with one expectation and one expectation only and that's to have a good time that's it that's your expectation people that go in thinking they're going to do this grandiose adventure and have like the epic like you know awesome like super dramatic like they maybe watch critical role and they think that's what it is I, yeah. i'm really hesitant on that kind of stuff it, especially having people watch other people's streams um I just say, like, you know, show up and this is this is play. This is hang out and play. Okay, so have a good time. That's our that's our goal. And, this is and make sure. This, what's that? This is a chill time. You're you're here to just be in yeah, a room like, together. <laughs> so there's a great video with Matt Coville from MCDM, and he says he says the weirdest question he gets after a game is his players ask, "Hey, did you have a good time?" He says the weird question for them to ask because he always counters. He says, "Well, did you have a good time?" Yeah, and they're like, "Yeah," and he's like, "Well, if you had a good time, then I had a good time." Yeah. And for people to be, one, have, uh, so you have to ask yourself, like, what's going to go into them having a good time? That's a, so what's going to, like, what's going to, what, what, like, we call, like, pain them or deter them? Uh, and we get a comment up, people are asking about your, pray, your prairie farm sat. Uh, <laughs> uh, the chat's not popping up for me, but eh, what's fine? Uh, you know, I mean, well, yeah, because you're out of southern Indiana, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's he's like you'll see him wearing outside of that. I'm like, well, there's a reason why. It's because you're from you're in yeah, Indiana. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like I think it's just the like Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri. I think are the only places that Prairie Farms exists. Nice, uh, but it gives you it gives you cred. Uh, so <laughs> so um, okay, so that, that's kind of thing about like what do you want to do? Okay, so these people, you know, 
uh, you know, you go out and you lay out your, you go out and you lay your chips down. You got, you got your drinks ready. You got your table. Are you doing this in person, right? Or like, are you? Yeah, to, okay. yeah. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure if you saw it, but I actually built a table. I saw your table. It's nice. My, my first like ever woodworking project was building a table for this. Just because I felt like it because originally I just wanted to host yeah. but then I like went to all the trouble of building the table and I built the DM station and it's all recessed and it has a built in screen and I'm like well shit I kind of want to sit at that <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's that's a trip then. So you you built the space. So that's good. Okay, first off, you have to play in a space. So that's really good. And I was just kind of curious about that because um, my games have moved over to uh, either online. I started I started a few online games this, this summer, and then also they've um, moved even hybrid. So my home game went hybrid. So I have my only people that come over are my nephew, um, who is, is thirty. I uh, just turned 30 uh, but uh, and my buddy that works at a hospital that like in, in a lab he doesn't work in like the front end he works in a very controlled environment so we're and we're pretty conscientious my other friends work at schools and stuff like that and we're, we're very conscientious of the pandemic um so that can make a big difference but if you're just playing with just people uh in person it makes it even easier too uh there's kind of a friendly environment and the like okay so um one of the first elements that kind of comes up with them is they're going to ask like well aren't there a lot of rules isn't there a lot of stuff uh like to to keep you know keep track of there's all these numbers um and i'm going to tell you that stuff like you got to protect them from it as much as possible you got to mitigate it don't show them a character sheet uh don't show them dnd beyond dude dnd beyond is horribly intimidating i i, I have a i have access to it for my students mostly to look at source materials but they get intimidated by the character sheet and all the numbers on it um, and so I'm kind of like, okay, well, let's, let's, let's not worry about that right now. Let, let's not worry about any of those numbers. That, that'll come up when you need to. It's just kind of a reference. And that's what the character sheet is. It's a reference. Yeah. It's not the direction of your, of your game. It is not your character. It's not your game. It's just kind of, kind of a reference of elements. Um, uh, Dwarf only starts taking fall damage if he's thrown more at higher 10 feet, at least in 5e. <laughs> yeah, there, there's actually an old rule. If you look at... Um, Back in uh, second edition in Birthright campaign, dwarves took half damage from bludgeoning, and that included fall damage. Wow! So you could toss them off a cliff, and they'd be like, "Whatever." <laughs> but uh, they I mean, kind of bounce. It's sense. like it's like gummy bears; they just kind of bounce. Um, so, so that's my thing. Is so that's not the, so. Don't show them the sheet. And and the other thing too, and this is probably the most important thing I do with my with new players is I don't tell them their options. Yeah. Don't show them like here's all the different classes you can be. Here's all the different races. Don't tell them that. What I usually do is I ask them. I say, okay, what do you like? Okay. What's a like movie? What, what, what's a what, movie? What fantasy archetype character? Not even an archetype, man. What's a movie you've seen okay. that you liked, or what's like a, a book you read or a show you like? Okay. Well, who in there do you like? Who who would you like kind of want to be or play with? Okay, this person or whatever it is. Um, and they might just come out and tell you elf. Like, okay, cool, elf. You like elves? Okay, yeah. cool. What what do you like about elves? And it's not just like you like an elf. Like, but what do you like about elves? And like they're like, well, I like that like they're really like sneaky and fast and everything like that. Okay, well, do you like them like in, in that in terms of their combat skills or that like can kind of sneak around? And so right there, I'm kind of already directing them to like a rogue or an elf, um, or ranger. Sorry, a ranger or a or a uh, rogue, and they can kind of go between the two and pick what they want. If they like the magical elements, I can kind of direct them over to like a more spellcaster type. Um, I generally try to deter players initially from playing spellcasters um, unless they unless they really ask to. Uh, spellcasters add another, another level to the game, and I can understand that. But but also, I'm yeah. not going to say no if they really want to. Um, it's more reading, like it's a, it's a role with homework. Almost. It is a little bit more homework, yeah. yeah. Uh, especially depending on what style. So we had a player that was playing clerics on my game and paladins, and he wanted to go over to wizard. And he was pretty shocked at how different wizard was um, in terms of keeping track of spells. Man, I even I switched over from playing a barbarian to a paladin, and there's more homework with paladin and that, even yeah. that is just like oh my god <laughs> yeah you just kind of like I, you kind of have to go through your references and, and know what your go-to stuff is and all that kind of stuff so yeah by all means um yeah absolutely and by the way thanks for we've got, we've got quite a few viewers now thanks everybody for tuning in um i'm not sure if you're here for me or tucker or just the general atmosphere you're here to party you're, you're here to hang out yeah it's all good <laughs> and you guys can hit us hit me with questions in the chat too and we'll be happy to talk about that stuff in the chat so please make it active so what you were mentioning about uh, not showing the character sheet, not intimidating him. So you you 
you'd start out, you know, kind of asking like, okay, what movies do you like? So how do you even get to like the role in the characters phase? So I usually, I usually kind of sit, what I'll do is I'll sit down on the character sheet myself and be like, mm -hmm. okay, cool. So is your character, and I'll kind of like build like a, a very general archetype style of it. Yeah. And then what I do is I ask them, I say, okay, well, like when I start coming down to parts that are kind of like iffy, like what is your character good at? Mm -hmm. Like what do they you know do they have like a skill like a trade they do on the side? Uh, or would you think of them as being more like, uh, like athletic versus maybe like knowing more survival skills? Which one do you see them knowing more? And I kind of ask them those kind of questions. Um, okay. Or which of these which of these options these like five four or five options for skills look appealing? Or tell me about their background. You know I'm not gonna give them the list of backgrounds because the list of backgrounds is huge. I'm just gonna say what you know where they come from. What was their what was their deal like? What they do before this? Before they set off on the adventure, what they do beforehand? What was their town like? You know, uh, I, most of my most of my students when I talk to them, like uh, they're <laughs> I swear to God, man, they love like because I, I guess it's because they're away from home or something like that, but they love having dead parents uh, <laughs> for their characters. Like I don't know. Oh what yeah, it is, that's man. a classic. That's the classic. It's classic, bit. right? Yeah. My wife, my wife always makes characters that have dead parents, and it's like both of her parents are alive. Yeah. <laughs> See, I got I got a pair of players in my group. They're actually a married couple, but they play um, a pair of dwarves that are like married, and they have like seven children and a bunch of grandkids. Wow. Um, and so, but they're kind of veteran adventurers that have kind of come back out of retirement to help out their friend. Um, and so it's kind of a fun it's kind of a fun thing. Um, but that gives me a lot more angle to work with too, in terms yeah. of like the role playing element. Like my uh, uh, the illusions I use against them are kind of are, are, are as I say a little cruel. Uh, there, there's at least been more than one instance where they were fighting obelisks and the obelisks made them think that they could see their children drowning and shit like that. Um, and they freaked out, you know, but it's like you, yeah. you, you leverage that, those characters things mm -hmm. they give to you, you leverage it against them and then they, you know, you kind of, you go reciprocal. And, and, but it makes for a much more dramatic moment. It, it, it definitely makes sense, like, why their character wouldn't leave that square yeah. because they're trying to, like, save their child, you know, where everybody else is like, what the hell is wrong with you? I don't care, you know, so it's not just, oh, you're, you're hit by a phantasmal force and you stand there for the next three rounds. It's like, no, you're trying to save your kid. What do you do? Yeah. Ah, you know, it's fun. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I, I try to stay, keep them away from the character sheet until the game. And when the game does start, I put the character sheet down in front of them and I say, don't worry about this. Yeah. I'll ask you to look something up and I'll tell you where it is on the sheet. And that's it. So you essentially roll and fill out their character sheet for them. Right? Well, I don't, I don't really, I don't really roll much randomness on their original character. I just kind of do selections and point by. But yeah, I try to abate the amount of stress they have by yeah. seeing all these little things going on. So you have to go back and look at like the way Gygax work, worked the game very early on. So Gygax would have this, he had this desk he sat at. And yeah. it had like drawers and shit. And he actually wouldn't like let the players have their character sheets. He had them all there. And so it was. I mean, that's a lot of that. You know, that that's a very intense way to do it. And you can play that way by all means. But I do let them have access to it, and they can ask you questions about what stuff means. Um, I kind of ask them like, what do you want your if you do take spells, what do you want your spells to do? What kind of weapons do you like? Yeah. Um, do you see your character as more of like, um, you know, like like the Dread Pirate Roberts from Princess Bride, or the kind of more of a bruiser type character? You know, what what do you what do you see? Uh, them and and let them draw on what they what they know, man. Like let them like let them illustrate it for you because they they know a lot of stuff. That's the thing is your players have a ton of experience. They've seen a ton of stuff. Like let them draw on that and use it for their own imagery. Huh. Okay. Because <laughs> I I swear to God, dude. I I remember playing as a kid and getting introduced to new systems. And like people get excited about the system, man. Don't get me wrong, man. I can I can geek out about like the stats and what's more powerful, what's more useful, what comes up, all that stuff. I can do that hardcore for like days. The problem with it is that like that's all going to gatekeep my players from actually having a good time. That may not be what they're it's, interested in. Which is just one hundred percent counterintuitive what you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You want to make it just you know if they're interested in that, you show them how they can learn about that. Yeah. Um, if you're going to give them a document to read, I would recommend not the player's handbook. I would actually recommend the PDF. Like if you're doing for like Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition, the basic rule set is actually yeah. plenty and good. So the the system that I'm looking at running, just because like it is so stripped down and so like it seems to me pretty mm -hmm. beginner friendly, is uh, old school essentials yeah. from the Chronic Gnome. Yes, it's basically just just back me. It's BX. It's it's a really a sliced down version of second edition. 
Yeah, it's yeah, it's a really cut down version of second edition, and that's a good way too. If you want, like my favorite simple system, if you're curious, is um, the Age system by Green Ronin Games. Uh, they they okay. debuted with Dragon Age, and it's like super simple. Um, and I love their uh, their critical hit system is fascinating because it's like um, it's like the best way to describe critical hits in it is like customized critical hits. You get every you score a critical hit, like based on your die roll, you get so many points, and you can allocate it to special things on your on your critical. Um, Okay. Like pushing them back or knocking them down or take it off or whatever it is it's kind of cool so but I, I yeah i like quick and dirty systems by all means i do find fifth edition very fast and very quick yes um yeah. that's why i like it because um, i started 3.5 what's up i started in 3.5 yeah 3.5 so 3.5's problem was they they outgrew themselves uh yeah. they put so much crap out there and then pathfinder comes along and pathfinder does the same thing and pathfinder puts out even more um and so it's kind of and that's why I think Pathfinder Second Edition is solid. I actually think Pathfinder Second Edition is really a really good system. I haven't played Second. It's it's all like feet based. It's really interesting. Like okay. um, the way that like races work in it aren't races. They're called uh, they're called ancestry, and it's like you you don't get all your abilities. Like for example, like you don't play you can't pick half orc or half elf as a race. You pick human with like elf ancestry. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, hey, Annie. Uh, that's one of my students. Yeah, critical double damage on him is good. Um, I do in my own personal game. Um, I use a thing from Nord Games called the Critical Hit Decks, and there's basically tiered decks. So the deck comes with like four different types of busy four different types of cards. Um, so there's like there's like fifth level and below, tenth to fifth, and then fifteenth uh, to tenth, and then like up upper scale. And basically, like you don't put the high level ones in initially because you'll just fucking kill a player. Like you'll just kill yeah. them. Um, like because they're like they're like I mean seriously, some of the critical hits are like quad damage, max damage. I mean they're like astronomically devastating, or like you'll take someone's limb off or something. So um, I use that because I like how dynamic it makes a critical hit. But yeah, double damage is classic. I mean this is an easy way to think about it too. Yep. Um, but no, I wouldn't worry about that too much. But uh, yeah, my, I think I think the main goal with bringing in new players is just let them see how simple it is. Mm. And people, it's like um, you know, if you start handing people all this like paperwork, they they get they get deterred very quickly. And I think that's what deterred a lot of players in the '70s and '80s, uh, even in the '90s, for a very long time. Um, is that you you can kind of like there's just too much on the page um, fifth edition to me is really fascinating because it only has there's only four types of roles in fifth edition that's it there's yeah. damage roles which are kind of obscured uh, but the, the core roles are ability checks attacks and saving throws that's it that that's the three roles in the game um, now granted there's some nuances to that at points but like you know that's it so but anyways, I I I detest, I, I detest. I'm I'm just going on and on about crap here. So, uh, but I guess like, what else are you kind of worried about as a DM? Um, besides just bringing them in and, and making sure you, you don't show them a character sheet and they freak out. Right. That was that was the big one. I want to kind of <laughs> I want to get a balance between not them being overwhelmed by the character sheet, but also I don't know. I, there's I kind of want to get into some dungeon crafting stuff just so I can have like tiles and like just kind of put put them into help along the theater of the mind a little bit. As yeah, well. I mean, you know, having a having a battle mat is great. You know, yeah. just kind of sh it, it's it's basically to make sure everybody kind of knows where they are. Um, so yeah. my home game, I don't do theater of the mind too often um, because I had I would have like eight players in a game and I need to. There's just too much going on. Yeah, um, I've had I think my largest my largest combat I've ever had was. I think it was nine players with. I think it was close to like 120 enemies. Gross. And yeah, like a big oh. mass battle, and so I had to kind of like navigate that a little bit. Where I, what I was doing with the, with my skeletons was like I was turning them to hordes, so I had yeah. to make them a blob, um, and I would make the players aware that they are blobs of, of skeleton, basically like a horde of skeletons. Yeah. You know, and one of the major rules with that was like um, they have no limit on reactions, like you know you can't. Like normally you only get the one opportunity attack, right? Yeah. But like the, the horde has no limit on opportunity attacks because like there's so many of them, right? You know, you, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, if they do swarm you, they get like advantage on, you know, all, so it's kind of just basic stuff like that and making them aware of what that would be. I think that's a big thing is transparency with players is once they're in the situation, how that's going to go um, to a degree. I mean, don't tell them like what's going to happen if they open the box or something like that, but like let them know that, you know, how that kind of stuff plays out. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, how a battle map? Just get like a basic uh, wedded race map. I mean, it, okay. it goes a long ways. I definitely have space for it on that. Too. <laughs> yeah, um, you can get a pretty you can get a pretty cheap one. They're they're super cheap now, man. When I was a kid, yeah. they were much much more expensive. But you can go on Amazon, um, and there's like a really um, there's a really good uh, battle grid. Uh, these are like a battle grid. I think it was this one. I actually have this one. Uh, I picked it up because it was so cheap and it was kind of interesting. I put it in the chat there for folks. Um, and it basically gives you like, you know, there's like a dungeon side, there's a jungle side, there's like a plain, so like a map looking side, there's a uh, snow side. Uh, it comes with some racers, but really straightforward. Um, and I think that's a really good way to kind of like, just start off cheap, man. Don't don't dive in. I have seen people that like, they, they kind of start up and they start dropping thousands of dollars on stuff. And it's like, dude, don't. Just like keep it very simple initially. And that's, well, the way I was going to avoid that was like, instead of buying like, you know, Dwarf and Forge stuff, which looks immaculate. Yeah. I was, I, there's a, a YouTube channel I follow, uh, Black Magic Craft, where he like makes all of his own stuff out of, uh, I was extruded polystyrene. Yeah. Foam. And that's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting crafty. I'm I, feeling pretty crafty. So I, I just got my uh, Kickstarter from Arch Architects Destruction that do a, um, they use open lock based stuff, but their stuff's all injection molded. So it's okay. like, it's durable. I'm not going to say tell you it's as good as Dwarven's Forge, but it's nowhere near the price. Um, okay, sick. And I, but I, and I, I went for the unpainted stuff because I know I can paint it. I yeah. know that, like, and I'm like, because it was like another 300 bucks to get it painted, and I was like, well, screw that. Like, I'll just go and buy like a like a spray. I already have an air compressor. I'll just go buy a spray gun and some paint for 100 bucks and just do the whole thing myself one afternoon. You know, so it's like yeah. that. That's it. That that's kind of the trick is that you can do a lot of that stuff. You, the sky's the limit. I tell people, but like, what I would tell your players too is off the bat is don't start with the big full blown table. You know, I, I, I do the tables on occasion. I love doing the tables. I love, I, I have done a one shot. I did a one shot at my universe, my one shot at my universe where I brought the full blown table and yeah. they were like freaking out about it. Like I did the full interior of a tower and they could, you know, we could pull the tower apart and everything. They were freaking out about it. But like the problem is that sets your bar really high and, exactly. and an expectation for, for players. Um, we talk about, I was talking about this recently with one of my friends online about the, uh, the quote unquote Matt Mercer effect. Um, and mm -hmm. I only I don't find that much with like players. I find that mostly with people that haven't played. Um, and so I think that's kind of a, an element is uh, you have to kind of like look at like does um, how, what what goal do you want to set with them? What expectation do you want to have it set with them and such? And I think you're okay if um, I think you're okay if you just kind of like uh, just keep it simple. Just keep it simple at the bat, man. Yeah. Uh, use little chips, like use like poker chips or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Tiles. Um, I do like you know you can go buy just cheap ass miniatures and, and use them for whatever, man. You know. Uh, That's, you I bought a big bag of the army man size one that I've just started painting like little by little for that specific thing, just as like placeholder ones. Yeah, you can buy. One of the ways I got, I got my miniature collection together was uh, I used to buy like blind lots of the Dungeon Dragons miniatures, the pre painted ones. I yeah. just buy blind lots, and then whatever I didn't want, I would just sell. I just sell them as a lot to someone else. Okay. And so that's how, like, I, 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 I not not to break. I, I have about ten thousand miniatures. Like, that's sick. you can that's name awesome. you can name something, and I can pull it out of my freaking drawer right now. Like, it, it, I'm that organized. You know, that's why I when, I said, it, when oh. I said that there was 120 skeletons on the board, there was literally 120 skeletons on the board. Oh my god. No. So it, it's that kind of stuff I like to pull off, but I don't do it all the time. Um, yeah, because it loses its effect. It loses its effect, and um, the WizKids Warlock tiles are really good, actually. Yeah, Scott brings that up. Um, the okay. the WizKid Warlock tiles are actually really good. Um, they, I kickstarted that. The thing I kickstarted was in November 2018, um, and the WizKid Warlock tiles are nice because they come pre-painted. Um, they're open lock and dragon lock compatible. So open lock and dragon lock, for the people that don't know, are they're open source uh, ways to connect things that you can 3D print. So if you're missing parts, like if you lose a part, you can just go back and 3D print it. Um, I, yeah, it's a great way to go, uh, by all means. Um, but yeah, wallet tiles are very affordable. I, I will say about the wallet tiles, the one thing I did not like about them off the bat was their first sets were only like that half height walls. Like they didn't do full height walls. Mm -hmm. like, and so like your miniature is taller than the wall, which like I get that it's abstract, but then they kind of came and back and were like, okay, well, I guess we should do the full height walls. <laughs> and yeah. and not to mention most of the, um, 
the uh the open locks that you print out anyways was, was already that full height so but i get that that's okay I'm, I'm not i'm not a big worry about that and everything like that too so um but yeah just set the, set the expectation i would just start in like and okay so let's let's also talk about initial adventure man don't just give them the most that's generic shit yeah because the uh with all with uh ose that's uh compatible with all the old like bx modules and you, you can do like keep on the borderlands yeah with that which was like the starter module, not just for players, but for like a lot of DMs yep. I know. Started with Keep on the Borderlands. I, I tend not to uh, do pre-made adventures for new players. Um, okay. I actually rarely run pre-made adventures. Uh, I tend to bullshit everything off the top of my head. But ninety percent of what I when I run a game is off the top of my head. Um, I don't. I do have expectations and stuff like that. I want to kind of meet up at. Um, especially if it's a big encounter, I tend to end my sessions when a big combat's about to begin. And that way, okay. when we start the next session, it's the big combat. We're ready for it. Yeah. Um, and I have it all set up, whatever it is. Um, but I would just kind of give them... What I usually do is with, with new players, especially, is I don't want to set them into like a long campaign and be locked into this character that they, they kind of pitched initially and they weren't really sure what it was. What I usually do is I say, all right, let's play one or two sessions with these basic characters we make, and it's going to be a generic game. So usually I do something where, like, there's goblins harassing a local farmer. Yeah. And I always want to create multiple solutions. So it's not that, like, the goblins are necessarily, like, bad or evil. It's that, like, they have a reason for going after this stuff. Like, they, they're kind of they're screwing around with these farmers. Or maybe there's a misunderstanding. Yeah. Um, they don't understand that, like, that farm extends that far out. They don't understand that's the limit of the, of the property. Um, or, you know, maybe they're, um, you know, there's some, something generic or there's something else bigger messing with them that's pushing them out of their own thing. So make thing, make sure you you think of the world as an ecosystem um, and give players options in terms of, like, always let them, like, let them, you, you say yes. Uh, Satine, Satine Phoenix will tell you that repeatedly. She says yes and, yes and, yes and. It's the improv, improv rules. Uh, it goes so far because people like that. It, it makes them feel good that they're not just being told like what to do or what's available. Yeah, of but you're not you're not putting them on putting them on rails. Dude, when I was a kid playing like a 12, 13 man, I, that's all I would do is I railroad player. I'm like, this is how it's gonna be because I'm the fucking dungeon master, so you do what I say. And it's it, it's not fun. I look back on it and it sucked. Um, yeah, it, it sucked. Um, so yeah. But all right. Um, you would just you would just come up with something of like a. I don't know, something of, of a very, like, run-of-the-mill, kind of a standard, like, starter adventure. Yeah, for them. nothing fancy, And then just kind of be like, okay, this is here. we're going to do this for, like, a session or two so you can kind of get used yeah. to, like, how to play. And then let that, let, that, let that little short story end, and at the end of it, be like, let them get to, like, second level or something like that. Let them get that, get yeah. that taste of a little more power. People are shocked. Like, the difference between first level and second level, especially in fifth edition, is huge. Yep, it's I remember. A huge, it's a huge difference. <laughs> And so let them get that taste of power. And then at the end of that, like just run that as a collective story that that's, that's it. Then you're gonna start your next session, okay? And you are like, all right, it's a new town, new place. You can play that same character if you want to at second level, or you can make a new second level character if you want to. Yeah. And that way they can be like, okay, you know what? Like, I really wasn't, you're right, that wizard was hard to play. I don't wanna play that wizard anymore. So I'm gonna try like the barbarian or I'm gonna try this. You know, I wasn't satisfied, and, and give them that chance to, to change it up. And maybe even they might just want to change their current character just a tad. Might just want to tweak it. So give them that chance. Um, I usually let players um, when we start my campaign. I usually give them like the first three sessions because I'm like because my, my players know we're going to be playing that game for three four years. Like yeah. they, I'm like if you want to change your character the first three sessions, you can. You absolutely can. Um, and so. And sometimes I get players that are just kind of like um, we've had characters who uh, whose arc essentially ended. They had their character had no reason to go on. They were like, I got what I wanted. Yeah. And so they're like, Yeah, my character's gonna quit the party. And so we have to a new character. And that's a fine way to go too. Is like let them have the options to fulfill their characters, and then the other character came back later. Um, do other other actions. So it's, it's stuff like that. It just goes a long ways. But let them let them like if they don't like something. Let them change their mind, you know. Okay. I, I think that so this goes back to me. Uh, so I, I I don't know how I don't know how Tucker I don't know how you feel about Tolkien. Um, Love him. <laughs> what's that? Love him. Okay, so I don't like. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Tolkien. But uh, the, the thing with Tolkien is that I'm 
I like the Cimmerillion more than I actually like his actual stories. Okay. Because it reads like a history book or a mythology book. Sure. And that kind of like, that scratches the itch a little bit better for me. And I like The Hobbit more than I like the Ring trilogy. I don't know. I'm goofy with Tolkien. So, so my, my attitude, so I, I, my, my reading of Tolkien comes a lot out of, uh, I mean, I read Tolkien before I read Moorcock, but then I started reading Moorcock's yeah. essays. And Moorcock's essays kind of clarify up some some of his issues with Tolkien. And one of the things he says with, he calls Tolkien a crypto fascist, um, okay. which is a pretty pretty heavy heavy claim to make. Um, Especially and, even for the time, that was that would be like a pretty. Heavy yeah, claim. I mean, this was he he wrote this essay and and he has an essay called Epic Pooh, where he he describes um, Lord of the Rings as basically an epic version of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> um, that that essentially, you know, at the end, everyone's just kind of. It makes you feel good. Yeah. Um, it's not there to like. Oh yeah, really, it's definitely. It's definitely just like a sugar rush. For yeah, sure. and so you, at the end, there's not really nothing's really changed ultimately. Um, you know, the hobbits go back to being hobbits, and the elves are elves, and the orcs are orcs. You know, what do you do with the orcs afterwards? That was that was one of the major complaints too yeah. about about like he does at one point describe that there are quote unquote good orcs, but he never shows them. Mm-hmm. Like it's so weird, but anyways, um, but that that element of fascism uh, is really interesting to me, and and I view as a writing instructor, I teach writing. Uh, that's my main my main thing. I actually don't teach Dungeons and Dragons that often. I actually teach mostly engineering writing, but um, writing to me fundamentally, especially uh, like writing a novel or writing short stories, is fundamentally fascist. You are the dictator of that story. Yes, I have compl- when I write a, if I write a book or a short story, I have an essay. I have complete and utter control of what goes in there and what my reader is going to read. Yeah, you're 100 percent controlling the narrative. You're controlling the narrative. So, but with something like a role playing game, it is a communal effort. It doesn't really work by yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, you need at least two people, usually three or four or five, whatever it is, and you co- you create a mythology together, which is the classic way that mythology comes about. It gets exposed through people's retelling and telling and, and sharing of stories and such like that. Um, and very rarely is it just one person dictating, literally dictating the story. And so I think that's that to me is the major element to keep in mind when you're when you're doing a role playing game is. Listen to your players, man. My best, myth, some of the best mythology. When I so when I start my games, especially a campaign. When I first started this campaign back in twenty fourteen, uh, we I asked the the players asked like, well, what you know? This is a new world, John. What 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 places are there in the world? And I'm like, all you know is that you are in a town on the edge of this kingdom called Osiel, and it is the boondocks of this kingdom. They have some sort of weird kind of festival they're having. They bring people from all over. Some people are interested in it. You could be here because you want to participate in the festival. You could be here because you want to like make a connection with some nobility. You could be just trying to get the fuck out of your hometown. Yeah. Like there's all kinds of reasons you can be here. I don't really care why you're, I want you to tell me why your character's here. And one was like, one of them was like, well, I'm here because I, I had a, I had to keep, I have to stay out of my town because I did something illegal or whatever it is. I can't remember what it was exactly. And I was like, all right, cool. Where are you from? Well, I'm from this town called Kalth. What's Kalth like? It's a criminal. It's a city of criminals. Okay, cool. That exists in the world. Is it inland or on the coast? They're like, it's on the coast. Okay, so I started, you know, I, I kind of I kind of let them build this place. <laughs> and now that place exists in my world. And then another one was like, another one of the players was like, well, I want to be an elf wizard. I could like, cool. I'm like, where are you from? They're like, well, I don't know. I, I want their culture to be kind of like this medieval Japanese society. Okay. Um, I, I want like a feudal kind of like hierarchy um, society uh, of elves that have like samurais and, and, and you know or there's like higher born and, and lower born feudal and I'm like, okay cool that exists now and I was like um, cool so now you have an elf caste system we have an elf caste system but that was only for the high elves and then I was like well the other elves the wood elves over here someone else was playing I was like the wood elves exist in the forest and they're kind of like wood elves but they're I'm going to say that they were like religiously pers- persecuted by the high elves and so there's kind of a, 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 and they left, and now they live on the other side of the ocean, and they're kind of adopted home. And so that creates kind of a tension there. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, we we created a few different like other elements. Uh, one of my players was like he wanted to be a bard, and I was like, well, what like what what do you like about bards? He's like, you know, he's like, I want to be a bard, but like I don't want to be this kind of classical loot playing dude. Like I want to yeah. be like a Middle Eastern bard. And I was like, okay, like have you ever thought about like are you thinking about like like Arabian Nights? 
and he was like, oh yeah, Arabian Nights. He's like, I'm like, oh, that's a Bard's Tale, dude. Like, mm-hmm. let's run with that. And so we created kind of an area he's from um, that that's a little more uh, like oriented towards that kind of like a uh, place. And so I, I kind of say yes. And some people are like, some guys are like, I just want to be an elf from the woods, dude. And I'm like, cool. You're an elf from the woods. Do you live yeah. with the elves or not? He's like, no, I just live by myself with my grandma. Okay, cool. That's it. That's your character. So you know. Oh, no. And so I, I think that's the big trick is like tease out what you want from them. Let them tell you because the thing is you can let your players do your work, man. That's the thing. That's why I don't yeah. do a lot of prep. My players do all the fucking work for me. I'm like I'm like Tom Sawyer, dude. I tell them how great painting this fence is, and I get them to do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, man. Like yeah, I make them do your world building for you. Yeah, and then all I do is kind of like keep track of it. The only thing I really have to do with it is I have to build the geography. That's about it. Yeah, and that's not too bad actually. Do you use anything for your world building like that? Uh, I do. I use. Um, I have a, a software I use, and I don't know if I have it installed on my computer right now. Because I, I reef. I did a new build. Uh, not incarnate. That's not what I was using. Uh, what was the one I was using? Uh, I cannot remember what I was using offhand. It's um. But- uh, it's not incarnate. Um. World Anvil? Was it World Anvil? World okay. Anvil, um, was it World Anvil? It was, a uh, oh shoot, I cannot bloody remember what it is. I have to go look it up. I, I have to go look it up. I have it, yeah. I have it somewhere, um, in, uh, my very large, uh, let me see real quick here. It is Wonder Draft. Okay. I use one called Wonder Draft. And I really like it. Um, it's uh, it's it's got some cool filters. You can make the maps look like like you can have the same map and like you can make it look like like it was done on like you know grid paper, or you can make it look like it's like a worn ass like map from the ocean. And you can just hit, click a button and it does it all for you. That's sick. Um, okay, yeah, yeah that's it's really cool, cool. and uh, nice. it's really easy to use. I liked it a lot. Um, I I've used a few different ones. Um, I used Campaign Cartographer initially, but Campaign Cartographer is like is amazing, but it is fucking complex like like learning photoshop is easier than learning car- campaign cartographer good on that yeah but the only cool thing about it is you can, make, you can like link maps in it so you can like link a file into another file so like you can have like your dungeon map inside click a thing and it brings the whole okay. dungeon but Sick. it's it's expensive and very difficult to use um world animal is not bad um i use two um um i use um one note microsoft one note to keep all my files in and keep okay. all my pdfs and keep all my my notes in um, I'm a big OneNote fan. I used I used it for grad school, so it was like hugely helpful. Um, so you were already familiar with it when you started. What's that? Using, you were already familiar with it by the time you started DMing. Yeah, it. and that's kind of the thing is use what works for you. Depending on how much access you want your players to have, we tried doing a wiki for a while, but it's kind of hard. We didn't. I, it was either I maintained it, and the other players didn't really want to as much, but that's fine. Uh, I got a question from Jason Jason He here in the chat. Do I recommend using tabletop? You mean like a virtual tabletop, like a VTT? Um, I'm not a big fan of them, of virtual tabletops. Um, Roll20... Neither am I, honestly. Yeah, um, because I'm playing online right now, um, and virtual tabletops are another layer. I think if I was beginning my game from scratch, yeah, but I don't. I do use D&D Beyond. Um, Personally, when when I'm a player, which is rare, I use D&D Beyond. All my players online are using D&D Beyond. I like D&D Beyond because as the dungeon master, I can go into their character sheets and fuck with them. So yeah. like if they get if, if someone steals from them, I can just delete it from their character sheet, and then they don't realize it till. Like, oh, you can access it. Oh, yeah. I didn't re- I didn't realize about yeah, it's all cool. Huh? So you're like yeah. you're like like someone steals ten gold and they go to pay for something and they're short and you're like they're like where'd my money go and you're like, guess you left it at the hotel room you know or whatever it is it, it's that kind of There's stuff. Thief, bro, I don't that's know. How, that's how that's how getting theft from is you don't realize it until yeah. you're missing it. You don't you, you know you don't whatever. So I I love that element, um, and you can kind of monitor their sheet uh, and everything like that too. Um, but on your campaigns you're running now, you, you just it's just kind of roll your dice in front of you, kind of thing, like for the players. What's that? What do you mean? Oh, Wait. like virtual tabletop? Yeah, I let them roll. Yeah. Their, I they can roll in D and D Beyond. They can roll. I, I trust my players, man. When they roll their dice, yeah. I don't I don't give a shit. Um, That's the, the campaign that I've been playing in since like April. We all just do it over Zoom, and everybody yeah, what I has use. their desk, and we just roll dice in front of I, us, and just it's honor system. <laughs> I do do, there are some cool, I know the D&D Beyond is working on a shared, like, dice table thing, or a dice tray. 
where yeah. people can see each other's dice rolls, which is cool, but like that's a little, a little ways off. Um, and I was I was a late bloomer to D and D Beyond. Um, uh, my reason being that that we were promised a virtual tabletop system in fourth edition that was that they showed off and it never delivered. Um, mm. There's there's video of Chris Perkins talking it up. I will say that you can go look it up someplace, but it, it's out there. Um, and so I got a little burnt on that. But their their problem with that was they were trying to do that in house. And Wizards' problem is that they're located uh, right by Microsoft, so all their programmers got poached. Oh. So they couldn't they couldn't keep okay. anyone on the team. But now they've yeah. outsourced it, and it's great. Uh, that's kind of their deal now. Is everything's going to get outsourced. Um, yeah. Short of the game itself, that, and that's a smart move. Um, and I, I've been really happy. DD Beyond, I've been really happy with actually. It's gotten better and better. I, I will say. Yeah, that. I, I use DD Beyond for for my sheet in that game, and I think I'm the only guy who does. Just because it's 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 easy. I can just click. I have like one monitor with the chat yeah. open, another yeah. one where I have my sheet up, and I can just do stuff. I like it too because I can share all my materials on there with the campaign setup. So I do have a subscription with the DM thing. Um, they were kind enough back when COVID hit and everyone at pandemic. Uh, Wizards actually gave out huge kits to like people that were associated with schools and libraries. And they mm-hmm. gave me like everything on D and D Beyond for free. Um, so yeah, I, I heard about that. Yeah, so I could, and they gave me a bunch of packs of magic for uh, Arena, and I gave them out. To, I gave them out to like the, the local club here and stuff like that. Hey, yeah. you know, here's like forty eight packs of Magic the Gathering for you guys online or whatever it is. I don't care. Um, but it's cool because I can share it with my students and everything too. So now they don't have to buy all the books; they can just go on D and D Beyond and look at all the stuff. Yeah. Um, and same with my players, but I do kind of restrict what my players have access to at times. Um, the what else was I say? Um, as far as virtual tabletops go, I'm not a big fan of Roll Twenty. I'm, I'm not a big. I haven't used them much. I tried them and like they're okay. The one I do really, really want to try is Vorpal Board. Um, my only problem with Vorpal Board is that it interfaces with basically your phone. Um, okay. You use your phone. You use your phone to scan pieces and also to monitor the actual like board you have because you actually use, it's it's a using it's a using the physical board with a virtual tabletop simultaneously. Okay, um, so and you can like, scan the pieces in, and then they can move them over the board and everything. It's kind of, and it sounds weird, but it, it does work. My other problem with it is that it ties up your phone, and I need my phone for like two-factor authentication and everything. So it's like I'd have to sit there and keep on swapping my phone in and out of their interface, and it's so that's my only issue with that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I actually when I run my if I do do a big combat at home, I actually run dual cameras on Zoom. Um, so what I do is I have a camera on me. And then I have a camera over the board uh, to run the combat. Okay. And um, I can then spotlight my video so my players can just just see that or pin the video or however I want to do it um, for them. And I usually use a uh, color. Mar- I have a um, little color. Um, I don't even call them like rings that go around the miniatures. They can I, they can ID their miniatures very easily. Yeah. Um, so okay. it's pretty easy, but you can also just do tokens or something like that too. Whatever you want to do. Um, yeah. But I'm not a big I, I'm not a big virtual tabletop person. I I like I like the feeling of things. Um, I like I mean I, I got in D and D because I love miniatures. That was what it, what came down before I ever I ever played D and D. I started painting miniatures when I was a kid. And I sucked at it. I actually had a green dragon I painted when I was eight years old, and it looks like fucking trash. Um, but but I like that t- I like that 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 uh, tactile. Uh, the, no, the um the tactile nature of it you know i want to touch the thing i want to see them in space and that's what the game comes out of it comes out of war gaming you know and that's a very yeah. uh you know i played warhammer for years too and and i uh i don't, I don't look back on that one but uh yeah you know it, that kind of that kind of element is kind of fun to bring in and such like that too so okay um and i got a few of you guys in the chat man I, i'm liking i'm liking everybody's tune in like i said yeah. i really appreciate it folks like everybody here i recognize a few names um do you guys have any questions man do you guys want to hit me hit us with anything or ask us stuff or Tucker, got anything else I can help you with, man? Yeah, we're just working through this. Um, oh, you got like a you got like a cheat sheet? No, I don't have a cheat sheet. I'm looking over at my table to see if anything comes to mind because I'm down here in my basement office and my table is just like right around the corner. So I'm just wife, like, wife telling you don't bring that D and D stuff upstairs. No, she plays with me. Oh, she like, does. That's cool. Yeah, she started playing um, two years ago. Oh, okay, my my wife when when we started dating, she she um she didn't really know what it was, and she she had heard of it. She's a school, she was a school teacher at the time. And she uh, she played with us like three times, and it was just kind of like she just wanted to see what it was about. Mm-hmm. And she was like, "You know, it's not for me." And I'm like, "That's fine." Yeah. You know, but she respects it. She likes it. She uh, she's also an artist, and so like she she paints, but she really likes it. Like me doing the miniatures. She likes the crafting element of it. She yeah. finds that really fascinating. So, uh, my, so my first exposure to D and D, my first time playing was three point five. But my mm-hmm. first exposure to it was I had an older cousin. He's like twenty years older than me. Um, 
and he uh, he went off to the Marines, and he left his uh, first edition AD and D manuals laying around. So that was my first exposure to it, and that kind of like informed like my psyche of what this is. And I was also getting into heavy metal at the same time. So that's really like where they're, where they're never turned back. So, well, that's where the genesis of like the band that I do came from. Yeah, was just this this cross melding of like eighties metal and like. Yeah. First, edi first edition AD and D modules with uh, sometimes not great art, sometimes amazing art. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just that kind of like crossed over in my mind. And um, I got a question in the chat. I think it's from Scott. Uh, how do you recommend running a game with just a DM and two PCs? So Ooh, that's the, a good one. So this be called PCs or player characters. So you can actually give a player multiple characters. I have yeah. played in games like that. Um, it's not a bad way to do it. You can give them like two player, two of them. Uh, just give them two characters each. One way to do it too is in the um, if you're playing fifth edition, uh, uh, if you're playing fifth edition, um, there is in the D and D essentials. I don't know where else it is online, but uh, you can get the uh, sidekick rules, which are yeah. really good. Um, or, uh, retainers or whatever. Yeah, they're, they're called sidekicks or retainers, whatever it is, and 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 they're you can start with them at first level, and they're kind of like just backup characters for you. Um, you do control to a point. Um, they're not, they will fight for you uh, to a degree and the like, but it's kind of a good way to kind of like set it up. So those are kind of ways to do it. Um, I have run games with a very, with a very small number of players before, like two players, and that's okay. You just have to kind of mitigate your challenges with them a little bit. Uh, make sure they can support each other um, and the like, or they have some sort of support network maybe, but uh, um, you can do it. Another way to do it too is to, um, you okay, bud? <laughs> You, you I'm none of my cats have popped up here. Nah, he, I, I have three cats. Oh, uh, he had like a he had a bath yesterday. He's trying to get a stink back. Oh so no! He's, just, he's rubbing anything that smells like me. He wants to rub on. <laughs> um, so uh, the uh, <laughs> uh, but one of the ways to do it with, with the small players. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they expand the rules in Tasha's in the Tasha's book. I really wouldn't be surprised. Uh, one of the other ways to do it too was, was is kind of have um, characters they can check out. Um, so you only have two players, but then like they have access to like six different characters, and they can kind of pick which characters they want for which time. Um, I've run that game before. It's, it's kind of a way to run like an adventurer's guild, um, and like people can put character back in the pool or whatever it is. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to approach it. Um, I, I find the most common ways to give them multiple multiple characters, but that can get a little confusing. Yeah. Um, and a little, they can also kind of exploit that. But I think the sidekick rules is one of the strongest ways to do it right now. Um, and the like too, but I, I've run games with two players just fine. You just have to you just have to think about the challenges a little bit, and you have to mitigate the challenges. Understand what lethality is to them. Yeah. Uh, area effect spells will kill them. Uh, stuff like that. So you have to give them a little bit of a chance, a little bit of opportunity. But that's a good. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, I'm hoping the Tasha book. The Tasha book should be really good. Actually, I'm looking forward to the cauldron and everything. Um, I think that one's gonna be really strong. Okay. Um, thanks for all the follows, folks. Dude, that's really cool. I appreciate oh, yeah. all that. I've got, I've got picked up a few folks. Um, what else? Uh, what else can I kind of like? Uh, any other kind of questions you guys want me to like hit you up with or answer? Yeah. Or anything else I got for you, Tucker? If you have any questions in the chat, help me out because I'm I'm kind of drawing a blank on this. Uh, <laughs> great answer. I got a great answer. A. That's what we cool. like. I. Uh. I, I really think I so one of the mistakes. So when I'm teaching my D and D class, I do have players. I do have my my students try to like start running the game. And one of the mistakes last uh, semester. Oh, this goes right in the question. I got a question. For, advice for a first time DM. Last while we're here. Yeah, that's um, exactly why I'm here. <laughs> uh, one of my one of the issues uh, I had last semester was I gave my, I gave them a bunch of adventures to pick from to, to run initially, and that was a mistake. What I've done is I've narrowed it down to the two kind of starter adventures. So one of them is uh, the one out of the starter kit, fifth edition, and the one out of the essentials kit, which is I Spire, uh, Dragon of Icepire Peak, and then uh, Lost Minds of Fandelver. Lost Minds of Fandelver is in my top five star adventures I've ever I've ever played in or run. Um, I will tell you what the best star adventure of all time is. It is the star adventure for the Dragon Age role playing game box set. It is amazing, and I had a friend. I had a friend throw stuff at the end of the game. Like he was so mad about the ending of it. It was amazing, and even six years or six months later, he was like freaking. He was pissed about how that game ended. That was, that's how good it was. Uh, <laughs> he's like, that's so unsatisfactory. Um, but that's kind of the point. Um, I, I think to start with a basic adventure and pre made characters. Um, I. I, I 
Ice Fire Peak does come with uh, kind of how to make characters on the spot, where Lost by the Fan Delver came with pre-made characters and they were also pre-leveled. Um, I think that's a really good approach. Uh, don't worry about all that kind of stuff initially. Just just keep it simple, guys. Like don't don't worry about doing all the cool stuff. Don't have someone come in with like their Xanathar's Guide Bard blended with this and all that crap. Don't worry about all that stuff. This is actually one of my concerns with um, the the shifts that they're doing with regards to how races are approached in. Tosh's I was wondering book. what your thoughts on that were. Um, my problem with that is that it is, and, and also with the expanded class options, it is more complexity on the system, um, and that's more intimidation. I don't think it's bad. I just worry right. about it adding. It's more options which people love. More options does sound good, but. Um, uh, there have been numerous studies. I, I, I listened to a thing on. Um, I listen. I listen to a lot of NPR. For those who don't know, I sit there and I play RTS and I listen to NPR when I'm waking yeah. up. Uh, and uh, there was a thing on Hidden Brain, I believe it was, and it's talking about like if you give people too many options, they will just they freeze up. They freeze up. Yeah. Where if you give them like four or five options, is good. So when I go, I'll give you. Okay, I'll give you a good example of this. So I, I take uh, my, my wife from Georgia, and they don't have a lot of Thai food out there. Okay, no. California, we got a lot of Thai food, dude. My my, my town I live in, we only got eighty thousand people, but damn it, we got like twelve Thai restaurants. They're all pretty good too. And so we, we I took her out for Thai when we were first dating, and she was like, she's looking at the names and all this stuff. And she's like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. She's worried about all these options, and it's a big menu. And I was like, look, here's the thing: pad Thai, pad say oo. These are very classic dishes. People like them. They talk about them a lot. I'd pick one of those. And she picked Pad Thai. She liked it. It's okay. And so, and then we kind of go off of that. He's using that as a base ground to talk about what's similar to that that we can eat that, that's, that's not going to be too much of an option. So just give people very basic options initially and then go out from there. Don't, don't throw all the books at them um, and the like. So when, I, when, my, when my class was making characters initially, I only give them access to the player's handbook. I didn't give them access to Xanathar's or any of that crap. That's smart. Player's handbook. Yeah. Um, you know. And that's that's part of the allure for like for systems like OSE where your race and your class are the same thing. Because it's just it's another degree less of overwhelming. But then you also get into uh, I think you kind of dig into creativity there a little bit. So I, yeah. Yeah, that, that that's the classic where the elf is a elf is what you what you are, you're a dwarf. Yeah. And it, they kind of stereotype those out. Um, it, that, that's not, that that classic like um, basic D and D stuff isn't necessarily a bad element, but it's also not great. Um, and it, but it does let people know what they're in for uh, yeah. up front uh, and the like. So I, I'm I'm of two minds of that. I, you know, I don't mind it on one hand, but a lot of people that play, you know, my, my friends that play dwarves, like they're like, I want to play a dwarf and their uh, image of, of a dwarf is Gimli. So they want to play Gimli. Yeah. Um, maybe a little more brutish, maybe a little more, uh, tactician-y, but that's, it's, it's some variation of Gimli. Uh, yeah, man. Well, we'll, Hey, don't worry about Sir Doobie brothers. I don't know who Sir Doobie brothers is, but he sounds cool. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll be sure to, um, the, there'll be a recast list. You can go back and watch it later yep. on too. I always like to keep my stuff up for a while. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I think that like, um, Lost Minds I liked, I, I really enjoyed Lost Minds. I actually played Lost Minds. Um, I can't remember if I ran that. I can't remember if I ran that or if I played, it. I think I've done both. Um, I'm, oh, that's a trouncer. Okay, I, I always forget that, that, that's Michael. That's one of my. That's Michael. Um, that's one of the designers of our of our new Cauldron and Tower shirts. Oh, okay. Uh, he's a super cool, dude. Uh, he and he plays our um, he plays our centaur barbarian in our group. Sick. Uh, the trouncer, uh, Tyrolus the trouncer, uh, and uh, who has never lived outside of the gladiator pit, uh, and is rather. <laughs> <laughs> didn't didn't understand nope. how uh, the brothel worked. He was just used to women being brought to. <laughs> used to like like mates and women being brought to him and, and alcohol and got in there and didn't understand the concept of money. Uh, <laughs> got him in some trouble. Um, but uh, yeah, the travels was a lot of fun. Um, it's a good, that's actually a lot. That's actually my that's my game. That's my uh, under the eyes of Zahash game on uh, Wednesdays okay. with um, you, you know you know Jerry right. Yeah, yeah. Walk, yeah. Very, very he, he did your shirt. Yeah, he did your strength check shirt. Yeah, yeah. He was a little stoked for that one too. I'm trying. To, I'm gonna try to get him to do a shirt for me too here at some point. I gotta. I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do the next. But uh, 
Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get him to do another one probably by the end. Nice man. Yeah, I have the I have the uh, old school uh, dragon you guys did the way way back with the uh, dragon on it. Yeah, with the uh, horror on the hill dragon. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, I got that one. Yeah. I got that one in my closet. Yeah, I, yeah. I have a big. I collect raglans. I, I love raglans. I, um, not enough bands make them, man. No, they really don't, and that's why I try to focus on the Cauldron and Tower. I, to me, raglans are fascinating because they actually have a they have a brilliant history, um, and they're actually named after a person. Uh, they have a military history that's where they come out. I knew of. they were named after a person. I didn't know like that's the full background. Of it's them. a lord. It's Lord Raglan. They're named after. Uh, thank you very much for the for the for the uh, follow. Yeah. So what it what it is is that this dude, um, his name. Uh, so I don't call them baseball tees. I call them raglans because that's what they're yeah. fucking named. Okay. Baseball tees comes later. We'll talk about why they're called baseball tees. So it, it was this dude named Lord Raglan who's a, a British uh, military dude, and he actually fought at Waterloo. Actually, he actually lost his arm at Waterloo. But he, um, when he got into power, he he told his military basically, he's like, all right, we're gonna redo the uniforms, and they're and they're gonna have the sh- the, the cut of the shoulders gonna go from the neck to down here like that, on all okay. the jackets, all the outfits are gonna go like that. And his his reasoning was that um, unlike a cut like this where it goes straight up and down, he's like, your shoulders actually shaped like that. Yeah. And the idea was that you could swing a sword arm better. That you would have a better swing because it wasn't like you weren't fighting against this or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it wasn't like binding up on your head it, or whatever. Exactly. So his idea was that that was there was as much frictional stuff. So that was kind of his idea, and um, the uh, and that's why they got picked up by baseball was because it's the idea you could swing better. Yeah, you know, it's more the shape of your thing. That's why I got tied with baseball. But yeah, it became kind of a fashionable thing to have this raglan cut, as they called it. Uh, but that's just the quick history of the raglan and why it's called the raglan. It's actually named after a dude. Um, Kind of a cool little thing, but yeah, it's a, it's a piece of military technology ultimately. So, yeah, those yeah. are my favorites. Um, also, white shirts. Bands don't make enough white shirts. No, I had a friend actually. He would if he went to a show and he didn't even care if he liked the band or not. He would buy their shirt if it wasn't black. Love He'd it. be like, I just I, I'm tired of black shirts. Um, and so yeah, I, I just bought like um, uh, I bought like uh, green lung shirts. I bought the raglan, but then I saw they had a non-black shirt that's in like the natural color, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna buy that too because it's not black. Like unbleached cotton. What's up? Like unbleached cotton. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, same, it's the same. It's the same exact shirt actually we use on our uh, witch's milk, uh, color and tower shirt, which is a which is a. Um, it's it's not treated at all. It's the natural spun cotton. So, but anyway, I guess we're talking about fashion now, guys. So that's all right. Well, so I, I actually do have uh, <laughs> some role playing stuff. Um, what is like if you had to like pick from memory what is the youngest person you've taught to play the game I mean it probably was my friends I was playing with when I was 10 okay I mean we were all kind of teaching each other we were all kind of figuring it out I, I learned a lot by playing the Eye of the Beholder games on PC when I was a kid and okay. that's kind of like how I learned the rules more of I played before that but uh, when I was nine, but like uh, I kind of understood it to a point, but then I started playing. Um, I be holding and kind of saw how the rules worked because it had tables and everything in the in the instruction manual. Um, that said, kids can actually there's actually a lot of resources about teaching children how to play. Okay. Um, uh, there actually are there actually is a cut down version of fifth edition, super cut down for kids. Um, very basic, very simple, uh, and you can kind of do that kind of stuff. Um, You've been teaching your six year play. She's picking it up very well. Yeah, kids are actually a lot smarter now. Uh, I'll say that. Uh, and they're used to video games, so they're used to systemizing and stuff like that too. And they can they can kind of understand the system. Yeah, man, take it easy, dude. Um, but yeah, you, uh, oh, hey, Jason. Yeah, you can kind of figure out like what. Um, it's really up to you. Um, I think that like you you but you do have to expect that level of maturity when you play with them. Like there, yeah. so there is that element of it too. And I, I certainly wouldn't invite a child to like my home game because it's pretty adult at points uh yeah most know. of my home games involve shotgunning beers at some point so that's probably yeah <laughs> yeah ours is more of like our content like i i do have a few of my players do have kids and there there has been elements where we i had like i talked to my players ahead of time about like certain things nothing like yeah. not like we're, like we're killing children or anything like that nothing like that like child murder but like more of like um uh there's consequences uh, to stuff like having yeah. like a, a child witness the death of their parents or something like that, what that might do in the future or something, or um, 
the death of a sibling or something like that. So we, we've had some dramatic elements like that too. But um, I was trying to, and that's a big thing to my clear up consent, dude. I, I can talk about that later too with, with all that. But I think I, we've been on for an hour, dude. We've been chatting for a while. Yeah. We got to do this again. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you want to do it next Monday? Same, yeah. Same yeah, bad time, same sure. bad place. Oh, yeah, yeah, dude. Thanks everyone for tuning in, too. This is cool. Uh, I'm going to be on again this week on Wednesday morning with my Under the Eyes is a Hosh game, which uh, I don't know if you know, Tucker, but that actually takes place in my main home game world. It's just on the other side of the planet. Sick. Um, yeah, so I have a huge. It actually takes place in direct consequence of actions my home game did. Um, and then. Um, uh, Thursday night, I have B. Dave Walters uh, talking to my class. B. Dave Walters, for those who don't know, is on Vampire the Masquerade, L.A. by Night, where he is Victor Temple. He is in canon, in game canon. He is the Baron of the Valley. That is, his character is the Baron of like Beverly Hills and Hollywood and shit, like canonically. That's awesome. Yeah, because the guy that runs the game is like the Lord Master for Vampire the Masquerade. He's the he's in charge of it. Uh, yeah, Jason's a, Jason Carl's a cool dude. Um, and then, uh, but also Thursday, I will say this, folks. Um, if you, I'm gonna be streaming Fall Guys like all fucking day because that's season two, baby. Season two, I'm the gonna get my fucking... wizard costume day one. I know I'm gonna try to get the wizard costume day one, and I'm gonna run my Fall Guys hard on Thursday. So that's it. Um, and that's kind of what I got planned for the week. And what do you got? What do you got planned? What, what else should we look up for you about about you, Tucker? Let's see. Um, Ryan, might, baby, might be dropping some new stuff. Uh, some new fucking heat. Uh, either <laughs> next week, maybe next week, maybe uh, the rest of the week. Uh, I'm going to be streaming with the company I work for, Monarch Media. We stream on a Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from uh, it'd be 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Central, oh, wow. so three to five. You guys' time. Uh, I'll also look at the schedule, see what we're doing today. We we're playing World of Horror. If you're not familiar with that, it's a one bit like uh, survival horror. Yeah, yeah, those are fun. It's cool. Um, playing my Zoom D and D campaign on Thursday. I wish we were streaming it, but we're not. But it is what it is. I, I think it's good to have a private game, man. I, yeah. I had a um, uh, for my so I so I swear I'm not trying to name drop. So I've been friends with Satine Phoenix for about ten years. I, I've known her for a long time. Since, yes, yeah. since LA. And my birthday this year, uh, around my birthday, we brought her into the UC to talk to students and everything like that. But um, I. Uh, I had her come for my birthday party and play D&D with us, and she talked about, like, liking not playing on stream. Like, the audience was just us. Just being able to enjoy, yeah, like... Yeah, and the other thing she liked, too, is that we were playing, like, a, a 13th-level game. So she's, like, she's so used to these first, like, fifth-level games. She's like, oh, I hate playing fucking newbie characters. And I was like, no, it's cool. I play a high-level character. And people are like, holy shit, I can do stuff. I can, I can casually cast fifth-level spells. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, like, I, I think there's something to say about... Uh, very sacred in terms of having your own home game that, that's private and feels good with just you and your friends. Now, My Eyes is a hash game. We started... We moved it over to broadcasting because some people asked about it. Um, and uh, I just kind of, I kind of want to show off that like I, I kind of have a fun little game here that's just purely electronic and, and online and, and shut yeah. it off. And we've been having a blast with that, guys. Like it's just been good, um, and the like. So, but um, yeah, man, have your home game, dude. Keep your keep you play how you want to play. That's the thing, man. The only wrong way to do this shit, dude, is to not have fun. Yeah, that's it. Like, make sure if you're not if you stop having fun, dude, okay. you're messing up. Figure out what you're doing that's wrong. It's been a blast. Uh, our our rogue in our party is uh, David Paul Seymour, who did. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's done a bunch of my art. Yeah, yeah. He's he he dropped a ship on somebody a couple weeks ago because he has like that ship in a box. Oh okay. Yeah, in fifth edition because he's a pirate. He's a, he's he's playing a pirate, but uh, he dropped a ship on a bunch of dudes. <laughs> I gotta ask them to to, to uh, guess in my game. My eyes is a hash game. That's the the requisite to play my eyes is a hash game. Is it you gotta be an artist or a musician involved in heavy metal? That's it. That's that's the rules. He'd be down, man. He's yeah. been having a blast with it. Good. Uh, you're asking Scott. You're asking if we're gonna play the game. Uh, yeah, we're hoping to do this weekly, man. I'm hoping Monday nights six yes. p.m. I got nothing to do, so. Yeah, absolutely. I'll make I'll make time for this. I'll make time. I'll, I'll tell my day to go. I like that away. positive attitude, man. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna bounce out, folks. I'm gonna go have some dinner. I'm sure uh, Tucker's got to get to the uh, the old bed. I got um, a bunch of kimchi to shovel in my body. You, you, oh, okay, kimchi, gotcha. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna uh, have him play us out. I got some uh, Thro Throne of Iron queued up here, folks. So do enjoy. All right, later. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching.